Uh, welcome everyone, my name is Elad Tabak. Um, I work uh, for Red Hat in uh, OCM, OpenShift uh, Cluster Manager. Today I'd like to talk to you about proactive software engineering. I'll start my talk with a personal story. Um, yeah. A few years ago when I was uh, a young developer, you know what, a lot years ago, many years ago, um, I used to have a different hairstyle, obviously. Um, I had the opportunity to be uh, pulled into a very serious customer-facing uh, uh, incident. Um, you see that software that we were developing was crashing on the customer side. And I've been asked to come and see if I can find a problem. And so I was working on my laptop and my manager was standing behind my shoulder looking at every keystroke that I was doing. A um, couple of minutes later some more people joined and it kind of looked like this. Uh, people were asking me what's going on, why is the system down, when is it going to be up, uh, when are you going to have a solution for us, what's going on. People texting me on instant messaging and for me inside it kind of felt like this. Luckily enough, I was able to find the solution or find a problem and then come up with a solution for the problem. But that was a really stressful situation to be in. Um, anyway, uh, a week later, my manager, he calls me in his office and he says, listen, you did a great job. Thank you so much for solving that customer facing uh, problem. And he gave me a bonus and I was happy. Everybody was happy. But I, I was troubled because uh, that was not a fun moment for me. Um, you see, when I look at the code, the developer that put that uh, problem, that the system was crashing on out of memory, uh, and that bug, that, that line of code that introduced that problem, everybody could make that mistake. I could have made that mistake either. Uh, it's like, it's an honest, honest mistake to make. And I was constantly thinking about how can I refactor the code, change it, introduce some testing, so these kind of incidents won't happen again. And in the next weeks and months, I came up with a number of initiatives on how to prevent these kind of situations from happening. But you see, I've never got a bonus for any of them. And it's as almost our mind is very fixed on you know, recognizing the hero for saving the day, but not really the engineer that prevented that problem from ever happening. Now, in this talk, I wanna uh, suggest some ideas about how can we change that equation? How can we create a culture that actually encourage people to take preventive actions and prevent these kind of incidents? So. I'll start with a little bit of uh, theory. There's two types of maintenance. The first one is reactive maintenance, which essentially means you only fix something when it's broken. You've probably heard it a lot of times. Don't fix it unless it's broken. And the classic example in a life situation is the light bulb. Usually you replace the light bulb only when it's dead. You normally don't replace it before that. Why? Why do we do that? Well. Theoretically, the price to pay for not having the light is relatively low. Um, it's cheaper to replace it, it's fast. You, you may use a different source of light for a while, a flashlight, maybe some other light around if you have it. So it, it's cheap and easy to do. But what about software? What happens if the system goes down for a minute? How much will that cost us? Take the hyperscalers, for example. How much does a downtime of uh, an AWS region cost to Amazon or to Google or Facebook? We're talking about millions of dollars a minute. That's not cheap, okay? That's very expensive, thank you. The other type of maintenance is proactive maintenance. Now, proactive maintenance aims to anticipate the problem before it's happening and prevent it from happening. Uh, there's two types of preventive or proactive maintenance here. Uh, one is scheduled. The classic example is 
changing the oil on your engine car. If you ever owned a car, you know that every once in a while you need to replace the oil. Because if you're going to use a bad oil, then it may damage the engine or make the efficiency of the engine uh, worse. So we just schedule a maintenance every year or a few kilometers, and we just change <coughs> the oil. One might ask, well, maybe I can check the quality of the oil, you know, drain the oil, check the quality of that oil. I, I can buy a tester and maybe check the quality and then decide, well, if it's good enough, I'm going to use it still. But, you know, the time it's going to take you to drain it out, test it, and you're going to buy that tester anyway. It's going to cost you time and money. You may get false positive or false negatives, and that's also going to cost you. It's actually more cheaper just replacing the oil. The other type of uh, proactive maintenance here is uh, data-driven. It's actually using signals, data, monitoring to decide, am I going to replace that component or not? And in real life situations, take changing the tires of your car. Like you can check the quality of the tires and decide if it's still good, I'm going to use it for a little bit more. If not, I'm going to replace it. It may be expensive to replace a perfectly good tire ahead of time, but you know, the price to pay for driving on the highway and get a flat tire might be more costly. So that's proactive maintenance. Now, with software, we can talk about a few examples of what it means to do proactive maintenance. A classic example is upgrading any dependency of your software. Take a database, for example. You have a database in your software. When are you going to do that upgrade? Um, you don't want to get into a, a database version that doesn't have support or doesn't get security patches. What about uh, dependencies such as uh, third-party libraries? Okay, Everybody uses third-party open source libraries. When are you going to do that upgrade? of that specific library. What about uh, upgrades of integrations? You have a system that's integrating with some third-party service. It may be an authentication service or a feature toggle service, whatnot. When are you going to upgrade to the latest API version? And of course, not only for external components, but even within the code of the software that of your own project, there's legacy areas where you can go in and refactor the code such that it will be better, it, the design will be better, it's, um, people will get to know it better. And so when the time comes and you need to introduce new code to that area or troubleshoot something, people will know and, and won't introduce bugs and know what to do with it. And of course, with software, reactive is just fix it when it's broken. Now. One might naively think that one can choose uh, one over the other, but it's not really the case because you're always going to have bugs in production. There's always going to be exceptions, panics, need references, uh, security issues, and you will have to react for that. You will have to fix it when that happens. But if you're thinking about proactive maintenance, then it may also help reacting faster to these kind of situations. For example, if you take Kubernetes or OpenShift in mind, then OpenShift will restart your pod when that crashes, right? But it doesn't fix the root cause of the problem. It just reacts faster to that problem. So the benefits of proactive engineering, first of all, obviously, it's improving the stability and reliability of the product. It will reduce cost because the system is highly available and customers are not losing money over it and your organization doesn't lose money over it. The development cycle is faster because engineering don't have to you know, do that ping pong between developing things or solving bugs or whatnot and go back to production and check in uh, the, uh, the problem that the customer is having now. It will increase the customer satisfaction because now, again, the system is highly available and reliable. And at the end of the day, it will also help the company's reputation because the product is better. 
Yeah, our proactive maintenance is all about planning ahead. When you're introducing that database, when you put in that third-party library or integrating with that service that you're integrating with, think about when am I going to have that time to upgrade to that latest version? When am I going to have time to upgrade that third-party library? It's all about planning at that moment of time. And this is maybe the most important slide of the entire presentation. How can we encourage people in doing that proactive maintenance? First of all, recognize initiatives. If someone comes to you and they have an idea about proactive maintenance, they want to upgrade something, they want to do some change, they want to refactor a code, encourage them. <coughs> Tell them that's a great idea and find the time to make it an action. What about role definition? Imagine every team had a person responsible for doing proactive maintenance. It doesn't have to be a specific person. It can be a, a role that rotates between team members. What about performance review? If you're a manager or a team lead, you can ask your developers, what have you done in the last sprint or the last quarter for proactive maintenance? And if you have a reward system in place, reward them for doing that. Post-mortem of incidents, we all do that. Take that into action. Make that happen. Follow that action. Knowledge sharing is very important here because all products eventually get to a point where you have legacy code in the product and you want people, new people, to either contribute to that area of the code or just refactor it so it will not break in production when the time comes. Key takeaways here. One, proactive maintenance and reactive maintenance is not a switch that you can turn on or off. You're always going to have both. Recognize the people that come up with ideas in doing so. And at the end of the day, it will improve both the user satisfaction and the developer satisfaction. And also, will save cost for the product, for your organization, and for customers. Any questions? Go ahead. Well, I would like to think that I have quite a unique perspective on, on this, this, this subject since I've been uh, DevOps most of my life and have been, uh, have been a developer for the last few years. And I'm trying to introduce the practices we have as DevOps to You know, I was that hero too many times. I, I had lost so many nights of sleep. And one thing that I did notice is automation. We, there's a very cool tool called, called uh, Renovate that we use for automatic library, uh, library updates. And it makes you re re rebuild your code every practically daily. So we use it. I strongly recommend it. You can find Gloria. Way and also uh, think about metrics. DevOps and operations in general love metrics. They can easily tell you what's wrong. So try to gather as many as many metrics as you can. That's my experience. Great comments. Um, it was really a question, but I'll repeat uh, the suggestions. One was uh, use tooling to make automation that will update your third-party libraries. And uh, what was the other suggestion? Um, uh, use as many metrics. Yeah, also. metrics. Using metrics so that you can get that information and make smart decisions upon that. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. Thank you for commenting that. So the question was, how do you manage prioritization? How do you find or how do you balance between proactive and reactive? Now, like there's no textbook answer here. The magic number is like, try to invest 20% of the time thinking and playing ahead. But 
for me, it feels like when you're in that point of time, when you're introducing, for example, a new dependency, when you're in that point of time where you have a, 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 a real situation, of a real incident, that's when you got the opportunity to uh, upgrade or plan ahead. When are you going to do that upgrade? When are you going to take that action eventually? And we're out of time. Sorry. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>